I'm Angela Kelly Robeck, host of the Empowered Principal Podcast, a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Hey, welcome back. Steve here. And today I'm talking about Alongside, an AI-powered chatbot with Elsa Fries, head of mental health at Alongside, and Jay Goyle, the CEO of Alongside. We're focused on helping students with their mental health needs. Oh, so much to learn. Thanks for listening and thanks for joining us. And by, by, by the way, it'd be so cool if you went to my website, stevenmaletto.com slash reviews and left a review. Could you do that for me? Say a few nice words and maybe five stars. Um, that'd be so cool. You are awesome. Enjoy the show. It's the Education Podcast, your favorite show, with lots of groovy guests, and they share what they know. So crank it up to 10 and let your neighbors know that here's another show with Dr. Steve Milletto. Teaching, learning, leading, K-12. Teaching, learning, leading, K-12. Teaching, learning, leading, K-12. Ah. Uh... With Dr. Steve Maletto. A report by the National Center for Education Statistics found that 69% of schools report an increase in students seeking mental health services, while only 13% can effectively meet those needs. Alongside an AI-powered chatbot provides every student the 24-7 Tier 1 mental health support they urgently want and can't get from overburdened counselors. The app is designed for middle and high school students. Today I have with me Dr. Elsa Fries, who is head of mental health at Longside, and Jay Goyle, who is CEO at Alongside. Elsa and Jay, welcome and thanks for joining me and say hi to everyone. Thanks so much for having us. Yes, excited to be here. Well, glad to have you here. And uh, for those listening who have never heard of Alongside, can you tell us a little bit more about how it works and why it was created? Yeah, so it was created partially because of the problem you just mentioned. Um, You know, coming out of COVID especially, we've seen uh, the mental health crisis affecting youth. Um, But the problem actually started uh, before then, uh, as we've seen problems grow over the last 10 to 15 years. Um, And so we thought... Most, uh, most youth who are getting help are getting it you know, within the school system itself. About 90% of those that can get help get it within the system. Uh, and we know that often uh, low-income uh, students have less possibilities for help outside of that system as well. So uh, our prior company was one focusing on educational technology and curriculum. Um, because of this problem, we thought, okay, maybe we can work with schools um, to help. So that's why we created Alongside. And uh, in talking with both uh, clinical experts as well as a lot of adolescents, uh, you know, we learned there's some things that would uh, make a difference that you don't have access to today. So they really need a confidential uh, and private space for them to feel safe to open up. Uh, And sometimes you can do that in a digital form, almost easier than going to see an individual person. Um, They need help at any time of day. Right. Sometimes it's right before going to bed. Sometimes it's one in the morning. Sometimes it's uh, right after lunch at school. Uh, so we wanted to provide them that as well. And then also kids, you know, we have all types of students from all types of backgrounds and language can be a barrier, uh, especially to talking to other adults. So um, we knew using technology, uh, we can communicate in a student's preferred language. So multilingual students have a place, again, where they feel comfortable to actually share what's happening with them and then get advice to help. Awesome. Appreciate that. The, uh, you know, one of the things that, uh, w- when we talk about, I mean, cause you know, mental health is a, is a huge issue. It probably always has been. It's just that it's become more of a, something that we think about today, um, as, as in the past and probably should have been thinking about, but, uh, that's another story for another time. The, uh, you know, how does, how, how do students use alongside? I mean, what did they, do they sit at a computer and do this? Is somebody with them? I mean, how, how does it, how did, how did they use it? Uh, so as Jay mentioned, students have access 24 seven to alongside, and there are three kind of common ways that students are engaging with the app. They're working through a challenge they're facing. They're using it to support their emotion regulation. And then they're also using it to kind of process and wind down at night. And so to illustrate that, I think it's, probably easiest to actually think through kind of a case example of a student. So let's think of a student, let's call her Sarah. Maybe she wakes up in the morning uh, late, 
I know that happens to me a lot. She's frustrated. Her mom and her get in a fight about being late for the bus. So she's on the bus. She's upset. She's dreading going to school. And what she can do is just open the Alongside app on her smartphone. And she's going to talk with our llama bot named Kiwi. And Kiwi is going to help her calm down by providing some empathy and validation. And then gently and slowly kind of push her to see the other person's perspective. And this is where the magic comes in that she's starting to engage with one of our evidence-based skills that Kiwi is talking her, her through that are actually developed by our clinicians. So by the end of this conversation, she has a short goal. She's going to text her mom. They are going to kind of resolve that little quibble they had in the beginning of the day, and then she's able to start her day. You know, the, next, the second scenario we see is students using this for emotion regulation throughout the day. So say again, Sarah, fourth period comes around, she's failed a math test, and her teacher comes up, and as she's passing out her math test, she just gently prompts Sarah to say, hey, why don't you talk to Kiwi for a second? Because I know this is really difficult. And so Sarah, who maybe is someone who leaves the classroom or needs to get support because she gets so dysregulated at times, um, is now just able to open up her Chromebook, go on, and Kiwi is going to direct her to some breathing exercises to help regulate in the moment. And then finally, students can process through journaling and meditations, and then also hear from other students by watching some of our videos. Um, and students are typically doing this kind of at the end of the day to process and wind down. Gotcha. It, so, I mean, I just had to ask this. So this is an AI chat bot. I mean, it, it, can you talk a little bit to the idea of, uh, I mean, how does it interact? Is it asking questions with a voice? Is it uh, a character, you know, a character on a screen? I mean, can you talk about that? Yeah, for sure. So uh, it just looks like a, uh, a text message, uh, you know, when you're texting someone else. So it's a back and forth uh, texting. Uh, now folks are much more familiar with this because of something like GPT and, um, you know, how AI is kind of, everybody's not heard of it or tried it at some point uh, compared to even a year ago. Um, we use AI in a couple of very specific ways. So one thing is, you know, when students are chatting, we use AI to kind of understand what uh, their need is. Um, so is it a friendship issue like Elsa mentioned or a family issue where um, I need to try to do some perspective taking, for example, or is this an issue where, okay, some uh, breathing coping skills was gonna be helpful. So that's one way we use it. Um, and the other way is uh, to provide that validation that Elsa also talked about. So uh, if I am struggling with a parent, even though we can help them, it's always good to feel like, okay, you know, that struggle is something that we go through and it stinks, um, but here's what you can do. So uh, actually uh, chatbots that have been created help with that uh, part as well for feeling that validation. Where we don't use AI is actually the skills that we're trying to help you build and the content that Elsa and her team of clinicians have developed. So this evidence-based skills we're using are based on clinical theory uh, that we have then converted into these chat exercises. And so we're still having students go through that type of exercise with us. But using the chatbot is much more comfortable and scaffolded than something like a worksheet, for example. And so the clinicians are able to convert their um, uh, those strategies into these chats. Gotcha. So... This is, uh, so I appreciate you talking about that, especially because, you know, at first I had this in, in mind that we're looking at, uh, you know, some sort of character or something like that, uh, but instead it's acting like, uh, um, so you're talking in uh, sentences or phrases and such, right? Correct, yeah, so there's that back and forth. Um, and we're very upfront with teams that, hey, this is a bot, it's a, you know, we have this llama character, um, and so they, they know what's going on. Uh, from the start. It's not like we're trying to pretend we're some human in the background or whatnot. I mean, the bot will make jokes about being a bot sometimes or <laughs> talk about the humans who program me, things of that nature. Nice. Uh, but uh, yes, it's, uh, you know, and they, I would say most teens appreciate being able to have this initial conversation without anybody else knowing about it, 
right? So there, there, in some ways for teams, there's a lot of comfort knowing, hey, this is expert advice, but coming through a channel where, uh, again, I don't need to be in front of anybody. Gotcha. So can you talk a little bit about the clinicians being involved in the development of it? I mean, how, what was that role um, like and what, what do they do to make this? I mean, because, I mean, this is not like two guys in a garage, you know, <laughs> saying, hey, I think I'll come up with this. It, they say this, I'll say that. I mean, can you talk a little bit more detail than, uh, you know, than what my strange picture was about? <laughs> Absolutely. We have an amazing group of doctoral level clinicians. And so kind of going back to this idea of the chatbot is delivering um, content and messages that are part some, a few AI that are validating, but 97% of those messages that students are receiving are written by a doctoral level clinician. And so what this actually looks like is we get together We are constantly looking at our data and understanding what our users are talking about and what uh, strategies might be effective. So we identify a core issue that we're going to try to address, such as um, conflict with a family member. We identify the core strategy. And then we are writing out these kind of very intricate scripts that are basically going to give a lot of options and feedbacks. So it's kind of this tailored journey that we're walking you through a strategy or a skill. And this is pulling from strategies from cognitive behavioral therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, mindfulness-based approaches, and even narrative therapy. So we're bringing all of those best strategies together. Um, in a conversational manner, which feels much more approachable and validating and empathetic to kiddos. Gotcha. That's cool. That's uh, so, you know, one of the things I got to say, so just like you have clinicians involved in it, I understand you also have students involved in the development of this product. Can you go into a little more detail about that? Oh, this is my favorite part of my job is working with students. Um, So we have three main programs um, to facilitate students really playing that integral role in our product development. Um, So we have a summer internship where we get to spend about 20 hours a week with interns. Um, Those interns do have an opportunity to continue with us a year long. And then we also have a national team advisory board. And a quick plug here, if you are a parent, a teacher, or a student listening and want to get involved, um, we are still accepting applications for our, our National Advisory Board, and you can check that out on our website, alongside.care. And what students do with us is they help us determine the core features of our app. They help us ensure the language you're using, the images, and the content is both culturally responsive and is resonating with um, the diverse group of students that we do serve. And they also have the opportunity to create their own videos and chats. So it's not just coming or advice coming from adults. This is an opportunity for actually teens to provide support to other teens. That's awesome. That's uh, um, so I want to pop back to something that you said a minute ago. Now that we understand a little bit about the development of this. So with, uh, you know, when you, when you think about uh, the different types of interactions that the kids can have um, using the, the product, what uh, um, have you found a w- way that they really like using? I mean, does something kind of resonate as this is more typical to the way that they will? Um, I think that was really bad grammar, what I just said. Um, is, is, there, is there a way that they like to use it is where I'm going with this? They really love talking to the llama. So we see about 80% of time they're engaging with the bot and talking through their challenges. And, you know, our, our interns actually had a lot of great insight around this. I was just talking to them last week and, you know, I was coming from this perspective of like, well, you're on your phone all the time. You're texting all the time. Like, aren't, don't you feel connected? Why are you talking to a bot? But actually, the majority of students report feeling quite lonely and disconnected. And so having that confidential space where it's like, no one's going to judge me. I don't have to portray myself in a certain way so that I'm liked or accepted, that I can just talk to this confidential resource. 
um, really resonates. And we've actually ended up making our chats a little bit longer to allow for more space for students to really just feel heard um, and validated based on that feedback. That's interesting. Yeah, some of the comments we get from students most often is just finally someone heard my whole story. Um, just the idea that someone has actually listened, let alone the empathy about, but just listening for the whole thing uh, without um, judgment or um, advice or any of that. So um, that could be pretty impactful for them. Oh, that makes sense. That's, uh, you know, it's one of the things that, uh, and, and just a note, well-meaning adults, you know, it doesn't matter what world they're in. You know, a lot of times though, it becomes, uh, you know, whatever three things they're trying to do at the, at the same time. Meanwhile, um, someone's trying to tell them, you know, Hey, I really, you know, thanks for listening to me about my, uh, did you just hear what I just said? I don't know if you did or not, you know, it's that type of thing. And, and it's, um, anyway, you know, it's, it, it, it happens. And I can, I can, I could see that feedback happening where there's, they're feeling like they're being heard. And that, that's why I was curious about whether there is a characterization that they're interacting with they might like because it appears that you know there is something more to it than just a sentence that appears or something like that but anyway i appreciate you talking about that that's 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 cool stuff i you know what uh one of the things that i want to talk about here is that you know mental health is a sensitive and complex issue i mean can alongside detective a student is in crisis and if so you know if you're getting the if it's getting the feeling that there's more here than just needing to talk about some situation that morning, what does it do? What's the next steps? Yeah, absolutely. So we monitor all our chats for anything related to suicidal ideation, self-harm, harm to others, um, and potential abuse. And we do have a protocol that we run if we detect any of those. And this includes, um, first of all, assessing risk using a research supported process like the Columbia Protocol. We're gonna direct them to 988 and local crisis resources. And then the bot is actually gonna talk them through and guide them through creating a safety plan, which is one of our most evidence-supported um, suicide prevention interventions. And so while all of this is going on, um, the school is going to be notified via an email or text message. And this allows them to follow up and make sure that student gets the support that they need. So these protocols, they don't replace that in-person safety assessment, but what it's doing is it's empowering the school counselors to know how, who to reach out to, how to triage the cases they are seeing that day. And we do work really closely with each school and district to make sure all of these protocols integrate into their current crisis protocols. So it's seen as a benefit and not just more paperwork or another thing they have to monitor. Gotcha. So one of the things that this makes me think about here is, so how, how does a student actually get started doing this? I know you talked about the phone and so forth, but I mean, I mean, it's, I mean, is it like <laughs> dialing? Oh boy, that's old school. I started to say dialing. Um, but the, uh, you know, it, uh, I mean, how do they, how do they in, engage? How do they, how do you initiate this contact? I mean, how does that happen? I mean, what's that look like to, uh, to even start the in interaction with uh, alongside? So once a district decides to partner with us, uh, we typically will go through this rollout planning uh, with the district and specific schools. And so we, um, we will meet with you know, principals of schools, counselors, explain to them uh, the app if they weren't familiar before the partnership, what it does. And we will typically try to find uh, a 20 minute slot uh, where they're in front of students and they can present alongside. So that might be in their homeroom or advisory. It could be they decide, okay, we're just going to do this in English class or one day or social studies class. And what will happen is either the subject area teacher or the counselor will give a short presentation about alongside, give students an opportunity to sign it to the app. So typically on their Chromebook, maybe on their phones and do a chat and explore. And that's really how they get going. So that's when all of them sign up. And then from there, you know, schools may present them in, in, when you go to the counseling office, remind them, hey, you can use this app. There may be calming corners in classrooms where they suggest using alongside. So they will encourage the use. We have one principal every day who says, 
you know, don't ruin somebody else's day, get on the app uh, and morning announcements. Um, so from there, it's, it's a variety of mechanisms, but what's nice for schools and districts is that it doesn't require a lot of intensive work um, by staff and faculty, which can happen with other programs. Like we are designed to be more student led and student initiated. Gotcha. So, so let's talk about the business side of a long side for just a minute. So you, your, your clients are the schools or school systems is correct. Very cool. So a, and I, I heard you mention the word principal. Do, do the principals kind of in, initiate it, or is it bigger than that so that it's actually the whole a system or something like that? Typically, because of what you mentioned before, what we're seeing, given the complexities of mental health, um, we are generally seeing uh, the district get involved, uh, and that will largely be during the counseling department and student services that would initiate a, a partnership. That partnership may be broad, they may start at two or three or four schools is what we've often seen and see how it goes and then expand from there. We're working with middle and high schools primarily. Um, so it's this partnership between those district level folks and those schools. Gotcha. So, and, th- and that explains a lot because like you were saying, there's that one principal that says, hey, go on the, go on there and, and, and talk and do your thing. Uh, what, uh, you know, so with, with those types of relationships, I mean, it, does it, uh, do you ever have anybody concerned about privacy or the thoughts about, uh, you know, hey, if my kid is talking on this thing, who's, who's monitoring this and keeping track of it? Or is it, uh, you know, do we have to worry about privacy, I guess is my real question. Yeah, so people always ask and, you know, what they want to make sure of is that we are, are keeping our data secure. Uh, we're not sharing it with anybody and that they have control over it. And those three things are things we do. Um, so if we're, you know, we're very strict about following FERPA and COPPA regulations, uh, as well as ensuring that uh, our data stays, um, you know, within our environment and doesn't get shared uh, for purposes that aren't helping the student. Cool. So I'm, I'm going to go back to something that you talked about a minute ago, which is the idea that uh, at some point what you were hoping is to have some sort of like a, a big group meeting or even if a small group meeting with uh, kids and maybe parents and so forth like that. Can you explain how... Uh, how that would work a little bit. I mean, cause obviously I'm a former principal. I used to schedule different types of things and I, I could see, uh, um, you know, that uh, the idea that uh, what, what's the best way of getting that message out that you, that you like dealing with as opposed to maybe the, the not so best way. <laughs> yeah. Oh, in terms of how to educate the community. About yes. What we're yes, doing? exactly. Yeah. So, you know, what we've seen is again, the community, school, and district relationship, they can be different in different environments. So uh, we lean into what a district is most comfortable or what a school is most comfortable doing. It could be something as um, lightweight as, hey, we send an email with the information about the app, uh, give parents an opportunity if they want to opt out um, to using it. Uh, so it could be something like that. Uh, then we've had other schools and districts that have wanted to maybe set up a, uh, a parent night uh, to exp- to understand mental health, or they just want to be educating the parents more, uh, let alone about alongside, but actually just about mental health initiatives in general and what it's going to take to help kids succeed. Uh, and we're trying to support those as well. So it, it runs the gamut, but certainly uh, at a minimum, we're always educating them on what we're providing and why, why the district has chosen to partner with alongside. Gotcha. Cool. I, you know, one of the things that is constantly being asked now ever since, uh, you know, we went through this planet of, uh, oh, my gosh, the world's coming to an end because of AI. And then we went to, oh, I think I could see how it could work for us. Um, you know, AI might be my friend. And then we kind of went back to the side of, oh, it's coming to an end, you know. And and uh, and so part of what happens in those discussions is, you know, um, the idea that maybe it's going to put people out of their jobs, Um so can you talk about how Longside complements the work of school counselors and other mental health professionals? Yes, yeah, certainly. So within the school system, you know, often they're using a model of, uh, of MTSS, a multi-tier system of support. And typically that model is tier one is for everyone. Tier two is for some, which is supposed to be maybe 10 to 15%, right? And tier three is for a handful, you know, under 5%. And so in a world where, by the numbers, 45% of teens are feeling persistently sad and hopeless, 20% have suicidal ideation, 
uh, the model that typically schools are staffed for, uh, it's just not enough to cover the need. And so what we're saying is there's a lot of students who need tier two support. And actually to prevent further needs, if we could help those students earlier with something more personalized, then we can actually prevent uh, you know, needing some tier three or other intensive support. So with alongside what we talk about with counselors and schools is that we're just trying to provide those brief and early interventions, you know, those five to 10 minute conversations that maybe a student has been pulled out of class for, or that they're trying to do in between classes. You know, if some, if a counselor is working for ELSA over weeks and it's 30 minutes a week, things like that, that is not something where we are going to step in and play that role. And so for them, I think understanding that we are covering these basic fundamental needs, um, but they're handling everything more complex, uh, it's a relief because right now they can't get to all the students that need the help. And so knowing that there's something there for them and that we will refer to counselors when needed and uh, to them that feels exciting. And so this idea that, hey, it's AI, is it taking my job? I think in a world of the stats that you started the, the podcast with, or just knowing that, hey, schools are 100,000 counselors short, like Hopefully they're feeling their jobs are secure and um, we know that human interaction is most important. And so we're just trying to fill a need when it, that's just not available to every, everybody. And certainly not every kid needs it. Gotcha. So let's, let's um, before we kind of shift gears, let's just kind of talk about, uh, so what are some common questions that people ask? I mean, uh, um, especially in, in getting ready to start it or like, you know, I, I got to imagine that you kind of get some questions they're probably a little different from the educators versus the parents um, and then the kids. Are there some common questions that uh, kind of float to the top always? I think one common question is, well, some of the ones that you've asked, what exactly are you doing here? Who are you chatting with? <laughs> nice. Who's the person behind the scenes? Wait, one. So there's that aspect. Again, people are getting more familiar with AI and chat. Is it, is this just the bot? Could they, you know, could they do self? So there's that all aspect. The safety aspect comes up all the time, right? Especially parents and schools. So what happens uh, when there's something uh, more, more severe and wanting to know that uh, schools um, can rest assured that they're covered there and, and parents can rest assured that they're covered there. So I would say those come up uh, the most, um, you know, who, who's, who's behind the curtain? Is it Wizard of Oz? And, um, and, and how are we handling uh, safety and re referrals? Very cool. I can imagine, especially because, you know, it, when you understand how it, I mean, it's sometimes, I mean, you go on a, uh, let, let's, let's talk about a car site. I mean, you go on a, on a car site to, to look at the cars and all you're trying to do is look at their inventories and all of a sudden, boom, this little picture pops up and it says, Hey, how can I help you today? And, uh, you know, and it's done in such a way that you're wondering, is there somebody there or is this just the program, you know, telling you that it's here to help you type thing. And, and I, and I understand because there's, I'm using the car thing, but there's so many of those types of interactions that you start wondering, you know, and I know this will date me tremendously and you guys probably never saw these commercials, but there used to be a commercial that said, is it real or is it Memorex? You know, and, and it, <laughs> you know, it's, um, I, and that's, and I could see the um, similar sorts of thoughts or the confusion or um, the idea about what this interaction is all about. And, and so if you were, talking to an audience, what, and what would you do to allay those fears that this is, you know, this is not some, you know, the, the whiz, <laughs> the lack of a wizard who's behind the curtain trying to manipulate people's thoughts about his power and might or something like that. Um, well, I think it goes back to uh, who's creating uh, the exercises and what they're about. So, you know, we've been in meetings with districts where, what, you know, you see faces of Elsa and uh, our other clinicians and folks understand like, okay, this is clinicians that are developing this content that are now making accessible to everyone. And, and that can be powerful. So you folks, I think are getting it actually, it, you know, it, probably even different than, than 12 months ago when it was, you know, the GPT craze hadn't started. Right. Now, of course, there's more questions, but uh, they seem to be understanding um, how it works and what, what it's about and, and where this is coming from. But Elsa, you have anything to add to that? 
Yeah, you know, I think one thing we hear is like, well, well students, you know, want to engage, will they know how to engage? And I think we have to remember that students are like 20 years ahead of us in the future regarding <laughs> their knowledge and ability to engage with technology. And so, you know, on their perspective, uh, what we're hearing a lot is, you know, I want to make sure it's confidential. And what we see on their end is they, they check out and say, Hey, is this like, is this like the other bots I get to chat with? Like, can you do math for me? And we have, we have gone through all of those scenarios and the bot does not give any answers to math homework and does not, write your essay, but we'll talk about your feelings about your essay, which sometimes kids don't like as much, but still, still find it helpful. <laughs> Sorry. That's funny. I think that, uh, Hmm. We figured out how to make the bot talk about math. All right. We could... <laughs> cool stuff. Yeah, students are not scared to push the limits. Exactly. Yeah. That's that's why I laughed. You know that as a principal, they want to push. Oh yeah, that's why I had to laugh when you said they're like twenty years ahead of everybody else, and and because they are, you know, it's the same reason that you know always, uh, you know, everyone's had them every, do everything from program the watch to, you know, that the, the adults can figure out to the, the planet that we're on now where, you know, they, they're, they're communicating with people all over the world and all kinds of stuff. And, you know, and it's, it, it is a fascinating aspect of it because they're more comfortable in, in operating that environment. Whereas uh, many adults may not be at least yet. So, but yeah, it is a big part of that world of uh, um, the panic that set in when people were thinking, Oh, my job's, my, this my world's coming to an end, you know, and then oh maybe not, maybe it will be helpful, and so I think you know, you're part of that showing that it's helpful <laughs> type thing. So good stuff, I, you know, uh, Elsa and Jay. If someone wanted to follow up and connect with you and or learn more, where would you send them? Um, the best thing is to uh, come to our website, uh, alongside dot care. Uh, on the top, there's a contact us. Uh, you know, happy to. Uh, set up a meeting with them or that gives them resources to learn more uh, about what we're doing. But that is, I think the best place to go. Very cool. I'll put that information in the show notes. And uh, so as we're finishing up here, I got a couple questions I like to ask my guests and uh, one of them goes like this. So if you guys could each take a shot at this, uh, how do you keep going when so much is going on that you may want to quit? And so oh, you yeah. personally, not the, not the bot, yeah. right? <laughs> personally. Me personally. I mean, I think across all areas of my life, it comes back to, to relationship and how we engage with each other. And I think what keeps me going, you know, in this role is really hearing the feedback from students. And so, you know, in my role, I've read now thousands of chats to ensure the quality and see what's going on and making sure we're meeting students' needs. And, you know, hearing things like, you know, I didn't know who to reach out to, but you listened when no one else would. Um, or things like, I mean, these are, I love children who are sarcastic and sassy. So like, your joke sucked, but <laughs> it really did actually help. Like, that is what is so motivating. It gets me so excited to continue to push. And what is a pretty innovative and high pressure and and sometimes overwhelming space. Nice. Jay, what about you? Um, for me, it's also about the students. One of the things, you know, I've spent the last 10 years or more working in, in education. And, you know, with adults, I think you expect them to have things a little more figured out. Uh, whereas with kids, you know, that support that they need, uh, when they're not getting it, we know the long term effects. So, uh, you know, for us to be able to help them provide that support, knowing it's making a difference and knowing they may not otherwise be able to get it. Uh, that is reason enough. But you see that in those stories that Elsa mentioned. You see it in the feedback. And we've had counselors say they've met with a student earlier in the day, provided them access to the app, and by the end of the day heard a suicidal outcry uh, and then were able to address it. And so even with our systems, like sometimes these things will fall through and knowing that we can be somewhere for students to go to help. And that is what's motivating for me. That's awesome. I appreciate you guys sharing that. You know, uh, last question here. Do either of you have a teacher in your past who made a difference in your life? If so, who was it? And what would you say if given the chance to say thank you? Oh gosh, I have many teachers I would like to say thank you to. Um, I think... One who stands out with me 
um, it was my middle school teacher, Mr. Clark. Um, middle school, it was awkward. It was rough. I was anxious. It was a bad time. And, you know, one thing he would do is he would just kick the soccer ball around on the, like, playground with me because I really didn't – was nervous to play with the other kids at one point in my life. And, you know, I think it's just those small things that – our teachers, those people who support us in our lives do that they might not notice that actually means so much. So I would definitely like to say thank you to him for making me like really just feel seen and heard in those moments. Excellent. Uh, for me, there's also several, um, but uh Two come to mind, maybe I'll talk about one, is my uh, AP English teacher, Mr. Malarski, who sadly passed away a few years ago. Um, he, you know, for, for me, I never took a psych class, um, and English was, as I always talk about, English was psych. You know, that's where he delved into how people think, why they're thinking that way, and he just would push us, um, you know, when you're reading something like of human bondage or, um, or Hamlet. And just really, really getting deep into characters, um, making sure when we're writing, we go from some broad thesis statement to get more specific, get more specific. And, um, you know, he was the most effective person I've seen at putting in a warm um, and just this heartfelt manner that you knew that he was out there for your well-being, for nothing else. And, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to strike that balance, I think, as a, as a coach or teacher. Um, but... Uh, he modeled that for me in the way that I try to then uh, live up to uh, every day uh, in my role. And so it was both what he was able to do for me in those moments of getting me to think and getting me to be the writer, but then who he was is something that I admire and try to be every day. Awesome. Thank you both. Uh, Elsa and Jay, thank you so much for sharing your, your path to alongside and the the great work you do to help tackle mental health support in schools. This is so cool. I mean, what a, what a, what a neat concept. And it uh, definitely is going to make uh, the idea of AI a lot friendlier face on it. I would think, uh, <laughs> you know, awesome discussion, wishing you the best in all you do. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hey, you have been listening to teaching, learning, leading K-12, a podcast to help you help kids achieve their dreams. Teaching, learning, leading K-12 is a member of the education podcast network. Podcasts for educators, podcasts by educators. Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 is a member of the podcast network based in Canada called Voice Ed Radio. Voice Ed Radio, your voice is right here. The opinions expressed on Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 are those of the guests and hosts. Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 is intended to share ideas, advice, and suggestions. Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 is produced for educational purposes. Hey, thanks for listening. It would be awesome if you visited my website at stephenmaletto.com and connected with me, left a review, and listened to more episodes. And by the way, you could also share it with your friends, with your family, and uh, your colleagues. Thanks so much. You're awesome.